This is really a love story, an affair twixt a town and a team, a town that had waited and waited for what seemed an impossible dream. Here's the pitch, and Scott hits one deep into center field. This one is back. This one is gone. The story had its beginning under the Florida sun. The odds makers looked them over and said, a hundred to one. But the team had a sort of a new look, a new manager stepping in, and he taught them a baseball lesson. It's much more fun to win. They came north to Frosty Fenway and won their opening game. And the fans began to sense it. This year was not quite the same. A young and exciting ball club, the Fenway faithful said, could this club go all the way? Most fans shook their heads. Um, past years, what has been said is, uh, so far this year is a repetition of what's been said in the years before. And uh, if it's any indication of what's happened before, I think we're in for another letdown. <laughs> Then they traveled to Yankee Stadium for an early April game, and a kid pitcher from Toronto knocked on the door of fame. Billy Rohr on the threshold with a tremendous performance today. Eight hits in the game. All of them belong to Boston. Rohr winds. Here it comes. Fly ball to deep left. Yastrzemski is going hard. Way back, way back. And he dives and makes a tremendous catch. feet roaring as Jastrzemski went back and came down with that ball. Two down on the Yankee night. Three runs, eight hits for Boston. No runs, no hits for New York. Gibson with a sign. Roar into his windup. The left-hander delivers. Line drive into right field for a base hit. Tony Canigliaro taking it on the first hop. No chance. A line shot to right field has stopped the bid of Billy Rohr for a no-hit game in his first Major League start. And the town began to take notice of this fighting, hustling team. Fifth place, perhaps, but pennant, just an impossible dream. For Boston had watched and waited 21 frustrating years while April's high aspirations turned to September's tears. But on the bench, manager Williams refused to sing the blues. He made one promise earned in a hurry to September. Congratulations. But on the bench, <laughs> manager Williams refused to sing the blues. Welcome, he made everyone. One promise earned in a hurry to do good days. Diamond. Congratulations. But on the bench, manager Williams refused to sing the blues. He made one promise earned in a hurry to do good days. Diamond.
class of 2020. have had the pleasure of meeting in the past. And uh, what better backdrop, as Phil said, too bad we didn't get everybody to autograph that. Uh, I have the 1967 have team as they appeared in, the past. in 1967. And, uh, what better... Nautical Beach Properties, our uh, sponsor here from up at Hampton Beach, and we can only hope that uh, the world will be back more toward normalcy, and when it uh, gets properties, back, properties, uh, we uh, have uh, here Nick Riccio and, and Nautical Beach. Mindfuls. This isn't uh, what's my line. Uh, from the Boston Globe, uh, I've got not one but two Hall of Famers with us. Uh, Kevin DuPont hosted Mindfuls. Big Bad Hockey. Yeah, what's my line? Uh, back a couple uh, of weeks ago when Globe, we had the 50th anniversary of the 1970. Hi guys, a little sound thing going on here. Everybody's yeah. having trouble with the sound, but hello. And uh, now I'm going to introduce, although he, he just uh, spoke, uh, Dan Shaughnessy. Hey guys, a little sound uh, thing Hall going of on fame here. Dan Everybody's Shaughnessy. With the sound, but hello. And uh, Dan and, uh, also, I believe, was uh, uh, he just uh, spoke. Dan Dan guys, a little sound uh, thing Hall going on here. Mass, uh, 14 years old at the time in 1967, and you had mentioned to me recently that the reason you became a sports writer, you were inspired by Mass, uh, the impossible. Dan and I have talked about this a number of times. Dan and I started on, on Red Sox duty in 1973. So, um, uh, or, or in, in the, in the mid 73, 74, 75. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I still meet people who, who, uh, very much, uh, talk about that summer and what it meant to them. But for me, it meant, frankly, buying the paper every day, scouring the paper, reading every game report, reading every box score, uh, living and dying with the team every night no, no, when it fully sort of uh, encapsulated all your thoughts and, and really all your social circles in terms of how they played and who they were. And, you know, and again, as, as you well know, Bernie, this was a, a franchise that hadn't done anything for a very long, long time, similar to what you and I talked about in 1970 with the, with yep. the Bruins finally coming around. The Bruins, there was the build up with the war. Uh, the Red Sox, it was different. They put in a new manager with Dick Williams. 
all of a sudden there were faces, identities, and success. And uh, we hadn't seen that for quite some time. I'm sure Dan would feel the same way. And uh, Dan, now we, we go from, uh, like the no school announcements, we go from Bedford to Groton now for Dan Shaughnessy. Dan? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, it's really an honor to be sitting here talking when I see these these guys on the screen here. And I see Jim Lonborg just came in. And and I, um, I saved the newspapers like Kevin. I was in middle school. Again, I was 13. And, you know, we had suffered. We followed the Red Sox growing up in Central Mass. And they were never good. And it was, uh, you know, eighth place, ninth place, 10th place, you know, down there with the Senators and Kansas City Athletics and just didn't know what a winning team was or a 500 team even. So this was, I know you guys hear it all the time and you've been hearing it from guys my age, your whole lives, but it's legit. It's true. There was nothing like it. I mean, um, having grown up loving baseball, having the local team, the Yankees just kicking our ass every year. And all of a sudden, there was a team that was not only 500, they were contending, they were pushing back. All the stuff that's in the impossible dream. I mean, we lived it. And I know you you guys, you know, when I talk to Yes, yeah, sometimes we remember it better than he does, you know, because he's not one for detail. But uh, it's all true. And what you guys, the gift that you guys gave to the region and to the impressionable young people at that time, it never goes away. I always say it's, it's the year that the Red Sox – it's like in the Wizard of Oz when it goes from black and white to color. You know, 67 is that year, in my view, the most important year in the history of the franchise because it was going, it was trending bad here. You know, the no, no crowds, all that stuff. And since 67, they've always been important. They've always been relevant. Even in a little bit of a dip or downtime, they would come back and there was faith they would come back. So hats off to you guys. It's an honor to be here and, uh, and thanks for listening to us. But I want to hear from you guys. Absolutely. Uh, that is our panel, and I'll uh, have an opportunity to uh, ask questions of uh, the guys that are joining us. And they are popping up like Field of Dreams. We have just want to kind of do the roll call here. Jim Lonborg is with us. Uh, we also, I believe, Dave Moorhead. Dave also. Dave is with us. Sparky Lyle, Al Sparky Lyle. Uh, Gary Wazlewski, I believe, is with us also. Gary? Uh, Bill Landis. I saw Bill Landis. Bill Landis is also aboard. Uh, Billy Rohr was with us earlier. Hopefully, uh, Billy is uh, is back with us. Uh, also uh, expecting uh, Rico uh, Petroselli, Reggie Smith, and uh, hoping to be joined by uh, Dalton Jones. And uh, also, uh, congratulations in order for uh, the Hawk, Ken Harrelson. Ken, welcome. Good to have you with us. So are we supposed to talk right now? Uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna have an opportunity. We'll, we'll have an opportunity to uh, to talk. I actually wanted a good place to start is probably uh, with the uh, the Cy Young Award winner from 1967, uh, Jim Lonborg. And uh, Jim, uh, welcome to our program here. Uh, who better than you to just uh, kind of address what it meant to have uh, change at the top uh, with manager Dick Williams coming in. And uh, Sal Magley, your uh, your pitching coach for that season, and uh, you'd been there prior to uh, 1967. And just to give a little bit of a perspective of what it meant to uh, to suddenly have a new sheriff in town in the town of Winter Haven with Dick Williams. So, so, so you remember those statements about Dick Williams? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> so, as, as the new sheriff, yes. As the new sheriff, I know. Uh, I think for. Um, uh, a lot of the guys that played with Dick up in Toronto, uh, they kind of understood what his uh, perspective was. There was a lot of us that did not understand. Um, uh, so spring training was different. And I think it was uh, probably time for all of us to, uh, I guess what, stop having fun and go out and, and win a <laughs> world's championship. Um, and I think that Dick was a stickler for fundamentals. Uh, he said, I just want you to catch the ball and throw the ball and hit the ball. And he kept things simple. You know, he innovated some new things in spring training uh, for the pitchers. Like he knew how boring it was for pitchers to stand on the outfield and shag fly balls from the hitters. I mean, that, that it doesn't get much boring, <laughs> more boring than that. So he had his play volleyball in between. Uh, over on the sideline. And I know a lot of the guys will remember that. And they probably looked over at all the pitchers playing volleyball. During Burrow in the training. 2020 years. <laughs> what is all that about? But, you know, little by little, it kind of, um, 
it kind of worked out because if we made a mistake one time, uh, he let us know. But if we made a mistake the second time, uh, <laughs> we, we never made it a third time. <laughs> and uh, Bill Landis, you had actually played with Dick Williams. Did you give these guys a little bit of an inkling as to uh, what they were in for in, in terms of uh, the, the, the new guy with uh, suddenly in charge of the club as the manager? I think we got a problem with uh, Bill with the sound. Uh, Bill's probably out arresting somebody. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. License and registration. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bill's got a little problem. Hopefully we get to Bill. Uh, we can go to Dave. Dave Moorhead, also a member of the pitching staff who had been there uh, previously. Uh, your thoughts with uh, Dick Williams now in charge of the Red Sox fortunes in 1967, having pitched there for the previous four seasons. Yeah, um, I played with Dick, I think it was at least three years before. Um, and as Lonnie said, uh, things were uh, – actually, I started the season – well, I went to spring training in 67 after uh, hurt my arm in, in 66. And, uh, and I, I remember playing volleyball. And uh, I remember Lonnie was a good spiker because he was taller than everybody else. <laughs> and then uh, I started the season. Uh, uh, I just started rehabbing in spring training. So I went to Toronto for um, three, four months, and then came back in August. But it, it was definitely different. Uh, Dick knew the game inside and out, and uh, he just had a different way of uh, getting his point across than uh, others that we'd experienced. And uh, from our panelists, uh, Dan, a uh, question for uh, one of our panelists there. Oh, my God. It's hard to know where to start. Is, uh, <laughs> Billy's not still here, right? We lost Billy. Uh, did no, we get Billy no, Roar back? There. Billy's yeah, he's back. He's there. Billy, Billy's on the, Billy is on the threshold. Billy Roar. Hey, was a weird, I did a thing later on. I mean, you know, I was too young to be working then. I was a kid. And, you know, there was a uh, – were you aware that, uh, that Jackie Kennedy was at that game? I wasn't aware of it until the game was over and we were getting ready to get out of the dugout and somebody put their hand on my arm and the somebody had on a suit and a long sleeve white shirt and I, one of those funny things in his ear like I've got in now. <laughs> and he said, Mrs. Kennedy would like to meet you. I didn't know whether I was under arrest or if she just wanted to talk. <laughs> uh, but I got to meet her and uh, she had little John John with her and she asked me if I'd sign a ball for him, and I didn't uh, have the presence of mind to get him to sign one for me. He probably couldn't write yet, but it wouldn't have mattered. Uh, I, no, I did not know she was there until it was over. Yeah, he was uh, – John F. Kennedy Jr. was seven years old then, and he's got kind of the Beatle haircut, and he's just a little boy. You know, it's four years after he lost his dad, and, you know, they were – of course, so famous, and, and there weren't that many folks at the game. Day game at Yankee Stadium wasn't the opener. And uh, year 1994, I, I had written a column about it, and I got a picture of little John John in the seats with his mom. And uh, I brought him the picture. It was a Stanley Cup game, and he was at the game. And I just, I just took it to him. I didn't want to bother him. I just said, "Here's, here's little you at the Billy Roar, almost no hitter, you know, back in '67." And he was very touched to get that. Wow. <laughs> I had not heard that story. Uh, Kevin, we'll go down. I was going to say I'll take uh, Kevin DuPont to block, please. Uh, <laughs> Hollywood Squares. Kevin, uh, sure. a question Question for one of our uh, current uh, dreamers up on the I'm screen here. I'm looking a lot like Charlie Weaver now, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Aging gracefully. <laughs> I'm wondering for many of those th those three guys, th there's there's always a buy-in period with a, with a new coach or the new manager. So when, when Dick comes in and th there's sort of the – back to the sheriff thing, D did that take a while to sort of everybody kind of, if you will, shoulder up and, 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 and buy into it? Uh, for me, um, it, it took a little while because I, I don't think that I'd ever been uh, criticized like that uh, in my <laughs> life. <laughs> I can remember a game uh, in Anaheim and, um, oh. um, 
And I was, uh, I think I had a no hitter going for seven or eight innings. And then uh, we had a one to nothing lead and I got in trouble in the, in the, uh, the bottom of the ninth inning, a base runner, uh, fly ball, uh, got a guy out, uh, run scored on a sacrifice fly, another base hit runner on third base. Uh, Russ Gibson, uh, is catching and, uh, I had an 0-2 count on this guy, and um, I threw a curveball and a bounce in front of home plate. Russ thought the ball went behind him, uh, so he went backwards, and the ball had bounced in front of him. And so the ball's laying there in front of home plate. I run down, try to scoop it up and throw it to Russ, and they end up winning 2-1. to one. So we're coming off the field at Anaheim Stadium. There's a uh, uh, kind of a bar there in front of the dugout where Dick Williams had his arms over the edge of the bar and I'm sitting there on the bench and can we swear on this show? Yes. <laughs> okay. We don't encourage it, but you can. Okay. No FCC to worry about. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm sitting on the bench and I'm really pissed off, you know, the way things happen and Rico Petroselli comes along and, slaps me on the uh, side of the lake and he said, Lonnie, hell of a game. And Dick Williams looked over at us with his arms on that bar and he said, hell of a game, my ass. Take a look at the fucking score. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay. So I don't think I ever bounced another curveball for the rest of my life uh, with an 0-2 count with a runner on third base. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy, this is Roar, and I remember the event of which you speak, and you didn't say okay. <laughs> oh, I didn't? Oh, no. No, you didn't, didn't say okay, and and I'm not sure anybody would have. Yeah, that was um, that was the, um, that was like the tipping point for me. I basically, as I think a lot of players did, said, well, I'm never going to ever allow him to – uh, put me in that position again. So I didn't screw up for the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> You're on your best behavior well, maybe, after that. Maybe once or twice. Yeah, but once or twice after that. Are we allowed uh, to drink on this show? Y yes, we oh, also oh. we also encourage that. You know, How often do we get through it? <laughs> <laughs> drink yeah, I what? One. I got one for Hawk. Can I ask Hawk one? Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. So, Hawk, I mean, and I, it's probably a long story. We don't have like two hours, but... <laughs> Like, how did, how the hell did you become available to the Red Sox? I mean, Tony gets hurt, and they got you, and you were a, a big, big-time player. How First you, free agent. What the hell happened with Kansas City? We got a, we got a problem with the, the Hawk sound there. Hawk? Hello, hello. There, oh, there he is. Okay. Okay, Hawk. You got it. You're up. Well, when, when Charlie Finley, we were in Washington, and when Charlie Finley fired uh, Alvin Dark, and Finley was a complete asshole. There was no question about that. <laughs> and <laughs> after the game was over, nobody was saying anything, so I blasted Finley. You know, and the next morning he <laughs> called me up, and he released me. At the time, I was red hot with a bat. I, you know, the only guy that was swinging a bat, uh, was the greatest player that I ever played with, of course, and that was Yaz. Uh, and Yaz won a triple crown that year. And all of a sudden, all these offers started coming in, and I finally decided, because I'd had – I remember talking about Dick Williams. I remember uh, the series not too previous to that, that uh, Lonnie hung me a slider, and I hit a three-run homer off of him. And the next time I come to the plate – Williams is over in the dugout over there screaming at Lonnie, who was Lonnie that year. I've never seen a pitcher ever dominate a league the way Lonnie dominated the American League in 1967. He was unbelievable. But he, Williams was through. Stick it in his ear, Lonnie. Stick it in his ear. So he said that a few times. And all of a sudden, I walked over towards the dugout. And I looked at Dick. And I said, Dick, I said, if he hits me, I'm not going after him. I'm coming after your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was one of those things as the guys were talking about Dick, you know, Dick Williams was the, 
I played for a lot of managers. Alvin Dark was the smartest manager baseball wise I ever played for, but Dick Williams was the greatest manager that I ever played for for winning. And he got things straight. And you know, we're playing in Baltimore one night, and Lee Stang the Stinger was fishing, and and Frank Robinson hit a ball. I was in right field, and he hit a ball. And I went back and I jumped up, and he just went over the fence there, and they had a gate out there with iron post on it. And I hit that gate hard. And I was at the time I was going bad, you know, I, I couldn't hit the, excuse me, anything. So I went down and I was lying there. And Mike Andrews had told me later on, he said, Dick Williams looked out of the dugout and looked at me. And he says, drag his ass in the bullpen and let's finish the game. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way Dick was. Dick, did, if you played every day, he took care of you. If you didn't play every day, I tell you what, you better be attentive. But these guys, I'll tell you, they, they, that was the highlight of my, you know, I have a, two great highlights of my career. Uh, being with the White Sox in 05 when we won the world championship and being able to play with the 67 Red Sox, I'll tell you, that was just something. And, and uh, Bruce Cornblatt, MLB, did a documentary on me and uh, about the 67 Sox. And I was telling them what a great player, a great clutch hitter Yaz was. And after the the interview was over, they were breaking down the cameras, and Bruce Cornblatt comes over to me, and he says, Hawk, he said, I got to ask you a question. I said, yeah, what's that? He says, uh, you just sat there for 30 minutes and talked about how great a clutch hitter Yaz was. I said, yeah. He says, you hit behind him, right? And I said, yeah. He said, well, why the hell did they keep pitching to him? <laughs> I said, I don't know. I said, I showed you how smart some of those opposing managers were. Yeah. Hey, gang. Hey, gang. This is Jonesy. Hey, Dalton, time Dalton, no here. Dalton is Jones Dalton is with Jones? us. Uh, Dalton oh, Jones is with us. What a good left handed hitter he was and a great teammate. Welcome, Dalton. Yeah. Great to have you with us. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, you didn't take offense when I had you on the phone last week. And I said, home run upper deck, Dalton Jones from Detroit yeah. on September 18th. One of the many clutch hits you had that year, uh, Dalton. Uh, and uh, we we're just talking about uh, Dick Williams and Dick Williams' presence. Uh, you were another guy that was there during the, uh, shall we say, country club era that preceded the Dick Williams uh, coming on the scene in 1967. Quite a contrast uh, as you look back, I would suspect. Oh, very much so. They, before that, the country club atmosphere, I mean, you know, a lot of guys on the team didn't care if you want to lose, okay? They just, uh, they were just out there. And, and, and the fact is, we didn't, we didn't know how to win. And, and I think that's what Dick brought in. You know, I mean, you, either, you either won or you didn't play. So, um, he brought he brought the game changer to us. That's for sure. Hi, everyone. And uh, Kevin, you have a question? One of our uh, esteemed yeah, uh, dreamers. You know, yeah, Hawk mentioned Charlie Finley, and we, we we shouldn't go through this Zoom without talking about Tom Yaki. And and we all know what a presence Dick Williams was that year. But I, I, I do remember an interview. I'll get off this quickly, but an interview during that season where. Um, uh, Tom, he was talking to uh, to Will McDonough at our play, at the Globe, and he was all ready to pull the team out of Fenway Park and open a brand new stadium over in uh, over in Newton Highlands, right off of 128. Which, as we all know, 53 years later, never happened. But I, I'm just curious, what kind of presence Tom did have ar around the team? We we remember seeing pictures of him playing pepper with the guys and stuff. Did, was he down there regularly? Did he? Did he? Uh, oh yeah, he played pepper every day with uh, Vinny Orlando. You know our clubhouse guy. He had his brown khaki on and his brown hush puppy on. He'd go out and play pepper before the game. Mister Yonke loved baseball. You know he. I mean he really did. And I'll never forget one of the most poignant memories I have as we're sitting in there after we had beaten Dean Chance and uh, and Jim Cott on a Saturday and a Sunday, which was a quirk in the schedule. And now we're listening to the Tigers playing the Angels. And they had a doubleheader that day. And the Tigers won the first game. And if they win the second game, now we've got to go to Detroit the next day and play them a one-game playoff to see who goes to the World Series. And so all of us are in there listening and to the radio. And, 
And all of a sudden, George Brunett was pitching for the Angels. Dick McAuliffe comes to the plate, bottom of the ninth. They got the tying run at third. And all of a sudden, Dick McAuliffe hits into a double play. That's the only double play he hit into all year uh, long. Season. Okay. <laughs> and I'll never forget Mr. Yawkey standing there beside Yaz. And when the game was over, they hugged each other and they kissed each other on the cheek. And I'll tell you what, that was such a – and Mr. Yawkey had tears in his eyes. And and I just can't tell you. You know, yeah, I call Yaz the renaissance man because he changed the culture of baseball in all of New England. Not just Boston, but all of New England. Bad one. Dan? So uh, off off that, um, I got to know Bill Rigby a little bit later on. And, I mean, you guys may or may not know this, but the Hawks talking about that, you know, the Detroit-California game. And uh, Rigby told me, I mean, this was really a great honoring of the sport that he tried to win those games. I mean, he didn't lay down, you know, it didn't matter to the Angels at that point, And they tried to beat the Tigers because they thought it was the right thing to do for baseball and it obviously helped the Red Sox. And he told me he had, he said he had three guys warming up in the bullpen the same time in the ninth inning in Detroit. I mean that's how intent he was to uh, to win that game. And quickly, I have a one for Dalton too. In the in the fifth inning, the big rally of the last day against the Twins. I mean Jim gets the bunt single, and then Jerry Adair lines hits one up the middle. And then when Dalton was up, did you get the bunt sign for the first pitch? You know, I don't even remember. I think I, I might, I might have. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, the third baseman, you know, he he had come in a whole lot. So uh, you know, it just was made to order, especially with the pitch, with the pitch I got, uh, an outside ball. So uh, you know, it just happened the way it did, and it was, it was great. Liney, Liney shocked the whole world. Yeah. By laying down a bunch. I mean, that was unreal. So, Jim, you didn't try to score. You didn't try Thank to score. you, Bobby Dorr. <laughs> huh? Thank you, Bobby Dorr. He taught me how to do all of that stuff, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, you yep. did it, brother. You did it all year. Three pitches and the bases were loaded in that inning. Amazing with that uh, Dalton right in the middle of it. And, uh, a couple of the other guys uh, that are that are with us here, uh, Al Sparky Lyle, and I uh, want to welcome him in also here. Uh, made your major league debut that season on the, the 4th of July, no less. And, I did. Uh, yes, and, and pitched well uh, down the stretch uh, out of the pen. Uh, also, uh, credit goes to uh, a, a certain Red Sox icon, apparently, to uh, encourage you to throw the pitch that became a signature pitch for you. That's right, Ted Williams. Ted Williams, um, when when the Red Sox drafted me in Rule 25 or whatever whatever they called it back then, and uh, it meant I had to go to spring training with the big club. And they had me pitching against a college team down there, and I think I struck out 12 in five innings. And I was sitting in the clubhouse, and Ted Williams came in when the, where, where this pitcher, left-handed pitcher was. He says, when you throw that curveball, you throw with your thumb up in the air, don't you? And I said, yeah. And he says, well, I could, you know, he could see it. And to get dressed, we're going back outside. And um, he's going to show me how to throw the curveball with my uh, thumb on it. And I said, well, why? Because they they don't hit the damn thing with my thumb off it. But he changed my mind. And uh <laughs> and during that session there, he told me that the slider was the best pitch in baseball because uh, it was the only pitch he couldn't hit when he knew it was coming. And he told me what it did, but he didn't really tell me how to throw it. And I was in double A, and I used to lay in bed with the ball all the time trying to figure out how the hell I had to throw that thing and do what he said. And I got up one night, I think we were about halfway through the season, and I started throwing this ball against the – the building I was living in, and this thing was going straight down. And I remember, I, I think Bob Montgomery was the bullpen catcher the next day. And I'm warming up to win the game. Eddie Papowski was the manager. And I said, Slider. And he says, You don't have a slider. And I said, 24 hours ago, I did. <laughs> I think I hit him on the foot <laughs> the first one I threw. <laughs> I'll tell you, Sparky, you know, listen, listen to you guys talk about Dick Williams, you know. 
by the time I got there, man, everything was running pretty smooth. I didn't know about all this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got there in July. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Parky Lyle, though, was one of the greatest teammates you could ever have. You know, I used to be at right field, and I'm saying to myself, how does this guy get anybody out? All of a sudden, <laughs> you know, he goes he, he goes to the Yankees, and he started throwing that slider. He stuck that bat so far up my ass, you can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Hawk, when I got to the Yankees, Ralph asked me how I won the pitch, and I said every day. <laughs> Sparky was famous. You know what he was most famous to our team. To our team was every time somebody had a a birthday, all the fans were into the thing, as was the media. <laughs> and they would bring these birthday cakes and sit them on on a table there in the, in the locker room. And Sparky would get stark naked, come over there, take a running jump, and put his ass right into the cake. <laughs> Happy birthday. When it all started when you had that Fenway Park cake and I sat in it. <laughs> <laughs> I love Sparky. Everybody loves Sparky. I love Sparky. you, huh? <laughs> we also, uh, I believe, from uh, direct from Connecticut, Gary Wazlewski with us. Gary, hey. welcome. And uh, Gary, uh, I was uh, looking back to the World Series and your game six start and uh, – at the time, there was some doubters about uh, you making that start, and you certainly proved them wrong with a uh, big effort. I think one of the references was Custer versus the Indians, and in this case, Custer won. That's right. That's right. Well, Dick and I were like brothers, though, even back in the minors. Uh, in the process of uh, uh, winning 18 games for him in 66 at uh, AAA level, he, uh, he liked me so much, he traded me to Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem was he forgot to tell Boston. And then they, I uh, guess, they called up and wanted to know how come the guy who's leading the league and wins strikeouts, ERA, hasn't pitched in a week. <laughs> well, I was up north water skiing because I, I couldn't get to the AAA team on the West Coast for Kansas City because the airlines were on strike. So when I came back from my uh, water skiing trip, I was back on the team again. But then I got in uh, trouble with him again in uh, Puerto Rico over the winter when uh, Larry Claflin came out and said, uh, what do you think uh, about Dick Williams? How are they going to react to him? And I said, well, if he uh, uh, acts like he did in uh, 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 Toronto when he comes to Boston, he's not going to win many fans. And uh, got myself in trouble with that one because I guess that made headlines back in Boston the next day. So I was in the shit house right there. <laughs> but he, I think he knew I could get a few people out once in a while. So that's why he gave me a chance on that six game. Mm -hmm. Worked out well. Got got to a six game. That was uh, all that mattered. Uh, Dan, a question uh, for you? I was going to ask Sparky one. Uh, first of all, just so you know, I, I had a I had a Cy Young vote in '77. And you were my first pick. You, it was a one. You had to vote one. Oh, two. I love you, man. I love you. <laughs> well, how the hell did you get in the Hall of Fame, Dan? <laughs> and, and it was, it was tough because I covered the I covered the Orioles, and you know Palmer was always lobbying for the vote. You know, uh, like yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I got to go with this guy. This guy's having a year like nobody's business. So we got it. So that said, um, did you ever have any relationship with Danny Cater? Because that deal became so famous here, and I. You know, poor Danny had no chance, but he's just kind of the, the unfortunate end of it. But did you guys know each other? Yeah, we knew each other. But uh, when when the trade was made and, and, I, and I went to New York, I all I could think about was that Danny was just not going to have a good time in Fenway Park. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I felt bad for the guy. I really did. He, but from what I understand... You know, he was a, a guy that uh, knew what his batting average was going to be uh, every for every at bat and all that kind of stuff. And I, I don't think that went over well with uh, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know for sure about that. That's that's what came back to me. But yeah. I was one happy camper <laughs> in in the when I got traded. Uh, Kevin. Back to yeah, you. I wanted to go back. I wanted to go back to Lonnie's bunt, uh, which I think was the sixth inning, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yes. But uh, fifth inning. Okay. Thanks, Dan. 
Dan, as usual, correcting all my stuff. That's okay. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, Ashley, I'm, Dan, Ashley, Dan, it was the bottom of the sixth inning. Sixth inning. Dennis. Oh, I win. It was. <laughs> X gets the oh, square, no. Kevin DuPont. Oh, he's checking his computer <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. so my question, the my question, about, my yep. question about the bump is, do, do you go up there thinking you're, you're going to do it, or is that a signal from the bench, or are you, are you on your own there? No, um, I was on my own. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Bobby Dorr, uh, you know, he worked wonders with all of us uh, as pitchers. Um, I could run pretty good for a, a tall guy, and I had laid down a lot of – whoop. That's not me. That's my phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the wine I'm drinking either. <laughs> um, but no, it's something when uh, I got up the plate in the bottom of the sixth, and you can check this, Dan. Yes. <laughs> um, right here, you know. <laughs> okay, I I accede to you. No, it's the six. Uh, I it's look. <laughs> so I looked down, and Cesar Tovar. Uh, was playing third base and he was not playing up close at all. And I just got the thought of my mind, we got to get something going. And I had done it a few times during the course of the summer and it, you know, thank God it worked out. Um, it was nothing from the bench. Uh, it was just said, we got to try to do something to, cause chance was pitching so well against this. Um, and as you said, four pitches later, we had a five to three lead. And it's, you know it's something such a about lot. that? Something about it, it, Lonnie's bunt. That was the, the first big moment of that game. Okay. And the second big moment was I came to the plate. I think Dalton was on third. Yaz was on first, one out. And I hit Chance had a great spitter. You know, he was a former Cy Young Award winner, and he threw me that spitter, and I was looking for it, and I hit a bullet right to Zoila beside the shortstop. And instead of going to Prabhu at second and double me up at first, he decided to come home. Earl Batty was the catcher. He made a high throw. Dalton made a good slide, scored, and that was the second big moment. But, but Lonnie started that whole thing, and I'm going to tell you something right now that Jim Lomborg, as I said, uh, I just never seen a pitcher dominate any any league like he did. It was all because of my ski and hawk. <laughs> 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 yeah. I skied all winter. I was strong like a horse. <laughs> you know, the thing about Danny Cater, too, was Marky was talking about. Lonnie led the league that year and hit batsman, you know. So we had a meeting before this 21. particular game. Oh, hey, I'm telling you. He, and and we had a meeting <laughs> that if he hit anybody, we had already picked out our guys we we're going to go after. Okay, so Cater comes to the bat in the first inning, and he's hitting third. I'm hitting cleanup. And Lonnie hit him right in the KC in that helmet. He looked like a coal miner with his lamp. <laughs> so he's lying on the ground, <laughs> and I run up to him. And I said, I said. Danny, are you all right? You're all right? He goes, yeah, but don't tell number five. That was Alvin Dark. Because Danny wanted his ass out of the game. <laughs> I got to ask a question. We've got, what, uh, Sparky and uh, Bill Landis. we got a couple of guys from the bullpen. Uh, John Wyatt was obviously a uh, integral part of the success of the team that year out of the bullpen. And uh, you just – Hawk just mentioned about throwing the spitter. Uh, was it true that uh, John Wyatt had a rather ample amount of Vaseline was part of his repertoire? I read something that Joe Pepitone said that he had so much Vaseline that he could have slid all the way to the outfield fence from the mound. <laughs> he had it. He had a little case of Vaseline, a little tube of Vaseline in his glove. He had unwind, you know, the windings in his glove and put it in his glove and <laughs> All of a sudden, when he get to the top of the windup, all he had to do was go his hands like this, and he'd get the. That's when we all knew he was throwing the grease, you know. But he'd had a good one. I have a John Wyatt question. A good story on that about the Vaseline. Okay, Bill. Yes, Bill. We're we got you. Park, and we're playing the Yankees. And Pepitone's playing right field. 
And before the game, where well, the game has started, but he's not the first time out there. He kept hollering. Wyatt did. Hey, Peppy. Hey, Peppy. And Peppy wouldn't turn around. Finally, he turns around, and he had a tube of Vaseline and shot it, squeezed it, shot it towards him just to put it in his head. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you this. This is Sparky. I'll tell you a story about John Wyatt when I first came up. The first time I warmed up in uh, Fenway Park, him and, him and I are throwing side by side. He would throw, and then I would throw. Well, I kind of, we both threw at the same time, but I finished first. Well, this freaking orange just landed right in front of uh, Wyatt's feet. And I said, holy hell, somebody just threw an or orange at you, John. He says, they're not throwing at me. They're throwing at you. <laughs> <laughs> Hey Billy, how you doing, buddy? Good, Sparks. Hey, I, I got. I, can I finish up a story? Oh, sure, Bill. All right, Absolutely, sorry. go ahead. We Let's had a little sound problem the earlier. Game in Anaheim. Yep. When when he got beat two to one. Well, if you remember, we did. We went to Minnesota after that game, but the next day, when it was a day off. So that night, <laughs> some of the players had a little get together out and about. <laughs> so the next day we went to uh, Minnesota and uh, the traveling secretary said that well, the bus would be leaving the next day for the ballpark early and everybody be on it. We got to the ballpark and Dick Williams had a team meeting and he went around and he, he didn't care if you were Yaz or Bill Landis and started chewing us out and told us if you ever miss curfew again, we're starting at 500, and that's for the guys making the minimum salary, and I'm going to take according to what you make. That was Dick Williams' way to tell us about, you better win. <laughs> that's the way Dick was. You know, that's the, that was the culture of the game. Those managers, a lot of times, they'd go locker to locker, just chew your ass out. You know, and as it, Bill, hey, Billy, first of all, it's great to hear from you, buddy. I love that Bill Landis. What a great teammate he was. But they go locker to locker and just tell you how horseshit you were, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's the way it was back in those days. It's not that way today. I have a John Wyatt question for you guys. Was anybody nearby early in the year when um, Tillman hit him in the head with a throw to second base? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Dan. <laughs> absolutely. We're, we're, set there. <laughs> we're, set, we're, we're in the dugout and – I don't even remember who we were playing, but somebody's on first base and they take off for second. John kneels down. He's looking at second base until he hit him with a 200 mile an hour fastball right in the back of the head. The ball, rick the ball ricocheted into our dugout and everybody starts screaming for Buddy LaRue, the trainer, because they assume that Wyatt probably is going to die shortly. <laughs> Buddy's up the tunnel. <laughs> Buddy comes running out into the dugout, jumps up onto the field, but he doesn't know why he's there. <laughs> he didn't see it happen. <laughs> Buddy's standing there in front of a few thousand people looking around. Wyatt is standing up, kind of rubbing his head, but not making a big deal about it. Yeah. And But that, that was the day that Tilly hit John in the back of the coconut <laughs> with the damnedest fastball you ever saw. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> also, wanted to get. Uh, I don't think we have Dalton Jones's uh, uh, picture up there. Wanted to get his picture up. They're going to put it up. Okay, want to make sure it's he up gets up the, this. It's you guys up on the post office wall. I was going to say we want to get him. <laughs> wanted dead or alive. There he is, Dalton Jones. We got the baseball card, the classic up there for Dalton. And uh, a question: Dave Moorhead, one of the contributors down the stretch. He had five wins, August and September. Obviously, all of them were big and critical. Anything in particular you think back uh, that you remember about uh, that stretch of uh, of pitching that you did for the club in August and September down the stretch run of the pennant race? Well, the big well, thing. Uh, uh, hello, Meyer. Can you yep. hear me? Yeah, Dave. Uh, the big thing was, as I mentioned before, and I want to go back a little bit. Another Williams story. Um, I played with him at three years. We used to drive to the ballpark together, him and Lee Thomas and I. 
probably 80% of the time from up in Peabody. And uh, so in 66, when I hurt my arm, um, came to spring training and hadn't picked a ball up since I think it was May and uh, hadn't thrown. Anyway, started rehabbing in spring training. And the first game that uh, I pitched in spring training, uh, I don't think I might've got one out, but gave up 10 runs and he left my ass out there for that whole drubbing. And uh, needless to say, he was not at the top of my list then. And that's the way that started. But uh, um, when I did come back though, it was, it, it was amazing the difference between I was there 63, four five and six. And uh, the difference in the atmosphere um, I mean, it was just 180 degrees from what it was those previous years. And, uh, and winning is fun. And uh, I think that's what uh, was the most exciting thing about it. Uh, you go into August and September and being in the chance to, to win something and uh, ending up in the World Series was just topping on the cake. So uh, it was great. Yeah. Uh, I remember those days back uh, like it was yesterday, and it was uh, something that uh, I'll always remember. Dave, off of that story, so in 65 when you pitched the no-hitter, I mean, right. there's no one in the stands, I don't know, 800 people, whatever it was. And, right, right, right. Came, um, and then Higgins was fired after the game, right? So During the game. How did that happen? Like, were you doing interviews? They said they just fired Higgins? I mean – what happened in the post game when this young guy throws a no hitter and then the guy gets fired after the game? Well, actually, I think he got fired during the game really? because it was reported that uh, I think it was like the fifth inning they let him go, not yeah. knowing that I was going to throw a no hitter that might have waited. But uh, supposedly he was walking across uh, uh, the bridge into Kenmore Square in the sixth inning. So, um, oh. yeah, that would, uh, it, it was definitely a different. Uh, <laughs> Different situation. Wow. Also, just want to uh, take a moment. I'll tell again. you that good Dave Moorhead story. First of all, he was the youngest player in American League, and I was the second youngest. And we all knew he had a great curveball. I never faced him. So now we go in to play him at Fenway, and I'm sitting on that curveball. And he threw me a curveball. He got it up a little bit, and I hit – I mean, I hit it over everything out there in left field foul, just foul. Well, that was the only curveball I saw of him in four bats, and he struck me out four times. <laughs> Fool me once, but not twice. Yes, sir. You're the Hawk yeah. four times. But, uh, also, uh, Hawk, we talked about uh, you coming over from the Kansas City A's, and uh, – where, do you consider yourself to be the first free agent because of the fact that there was, what, about a half a dozen clubs that were after you? And uh, the fact that you negotiated a rather hefty raise to come to Boston. Well, every club in baseball, with the exception of a couple, and, and, and also the Tokyo Giants wanted, everybody was calling to sign me because I was red hot at the time. And I was making $12,000 a year. And... Uh, to make a long story short, all these clubs are coming, and I finally signed with Boston for 150000 And uh, I had just had a big series against them uh, prior to that, not too, you know. And, and, and I knew that it was going to be a, a – a, and I asked Alvin Dark, I said, Alvin, I said, what do you think is going to happen here? Because I called him after Finley had fired him. And I said, what's going to happen? He said, Kenneth, he says, you're a lucky young man. He said, the way you're swinging the bat, he said, you got four clubs. You got the Twins, the Tigers, the Red Sox, and the White Sox, all in this pennant race, which they call the greatest pennant race in the history of the game. And he said, I think what you're going to do is I think you're going to get 150000 at least out of this thing. And I was making 12000 You're going to get 150000 and whatever team you go to is going to win the pennant and it wound up. I, I got 150,000. I go to the Red Sox 
And Yaz won the pennant for us. And Yaz and Lonnie, I should say. And, you know, mm -hmm. when Rico, Rico. Rico is one of the most unsung heroes of that whole thing. I love Rico. Rico right now is doing a radio show for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And he was just a very quiet guy. I mean, really quiet and unassuming. And he was, i tell you one thing. You didn't want to mess with him because if you ever pissed him off, you got a problem. <laughs> ah. Did you ever actually eat at the Hawk Shop on Mass Ave? No. <laughs> he knew better. <laughs> I was going to take a time out here and uh, from uh, Nick's collection. He uh, was kind enough to, I guess everybody in New England had this, right? Dan, Kevin, the impossible uh -huh. dream. And uh, Nick, our sponsor from uh, Nautical Beach Properties, uh, great sports collector and, uh, he uh, donated his copy for the uh, broadcast. And uh, once again, uh, when uh, things get back to normal and you want to get to the beach and uh, nautical beach properties up at Hampton beach, New Hampshire, and uh, Nick Riccio will definitely uh, take care of you. Uh, nautical beach properties.com and reservations at nautical beach properties.com. And uh, tell Nick that, uh, that we sent you uh, Gary talking about the Hawk getting that hefty raise. Uh, was still in the era in baseball of off-season jobs. You and Gary Bell. Gary Bell is in the process of moving uh, from Texas to Arizona uh, and uh, sent his regrets uh, this morning. But uh, you had a job actually with the Red Sox in the off-season after 67. Yeah, that's right. Gary Bell and I were out promoting uh, season tickets to all the major uh, companies in the Boston area. We shook hands with about 2,000 people a day. <laughs> <laughs> Literally had blisters from everybody uh, wanting to shake your hand and uh, write autographs. And uh, we had a hell of a time. Um, met some great people, got some great gifts, uh, food, uh, all kinds of stuff that people are handing out to us uh, as we were uh, visiting meat markets and slaughterhouses, banks, uh, you name it. Um, had a great time doing it. And uh, first all you had to do is follow Bell around and laugh your butt off uh, with his comments most of the time. I think I'm you guys are coming to Arizona because I lived there half the year and I just came back. I go, uh oh, oh here he comes again. <laughs> <laughs> he's coming. He's coming to Arizona. Me, he's still mad at me because he says I got his start, the sixth game. He said, I never should have mm -hmm. had that. That was his game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kevin, it, uh, question for uh, any yeah, of the dreamers for you? For anybody here, Hawk was talking about Yaz's year and winning the Triple Crown and and I, I know the context is different here, but we, we saw all the stress that was on Maris when Maris was chasing Ruth's record. And, you know, the year Yaz had was just so unbelievable. I, I'm wondering what, what sort of, you know, from watching him in the room there, how did, how did he cope with it? How did he, you know, internalize the pressure that year? Because it was, it was such a performance. I'll tell you one thing about Yaz and – we're in the sixth game of the World Series against the Cardinals, and they bring in this left-hander to face him named Joe Horner. And Carl had never faced him before, and I'd faced him a lot in winter ball and all that stuff. And so he comes over to me. I'm in the on-deck circle. He says, you know this guy? I said, yeah. I said, I said yes. Yeah. I said, he's a foot quicker than he looks. He was really a sneaky. A little short arm and left-hander came right out of his chest, you know. I said, but he's a foot quicker than he looks. Now, I'll never forget this. One of the most poignant moments of my whole career. Horner goes, he gets in the box. Horner throws him that little fastball he's had right out of the thing. Yaz hit it about 15 rows up in that bullpen out there over the right center field bullpen. And I'll never forget this. He's going around first base, and I'm saying to myself, Hawk, if that's what it takes to be a great hitter, we will never get there. <laughs> <laughs> he was unbelievable. I, I, I mean, he, he was, you just can't have a better year than he had. I mean, he won the triple crown in the midst of the greatest pennant race in the history of the game, you know, and he was such an inspiration, but he didn't, Yaz didn't say shit. I mean, he, he was going to, he, he was not, he would accommodate the media, but he would go to his locker. And I used to watch him all the time because my locker was right around the corner from his. And he'd just sit there. Now, he'd go into Vinny's room, Orlando's, you know, and, and back there. 
And a lot of times we'd be playing on a hot day there at Fenway. And he'd go back there in about the fifth or sixth inning and have about an ounce of, well, he'd have a shot of uh, a VO, you know. <laughs> if uh, you or me or anybody else, it might knock us on our ass. But he would go in there and have that shot. And he'd come out, and next thing you know, he'd just hit a three-run homer. <laughs> what a guy. What a guy. Dan? Well, I already broke Hawks balls about the Hawks shops, but while I'm rolling here, <laughs> I, I have to ask, uh, what was up with the Nehru suit, Nehru jackets, and, and how often do you get asked to sign this Sports Illustrated cover when you're wearing that thing? Well, I'm having a good time in this interview because I, I, I love you guys and I, I miss you, but don't ruin my day, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no I fashion statements. Every, you look a lot better. I bought one of every color. I had like five or six colors. I bought one of every color, and I got to wear that blue one, and that's the one they put on. <laughs> Blue and that was the only time I ever wore them. They went out of style as fast as they came in. <laughs> he said they went out of style as fast as they came in. <laughs> you know, one of the guy, one of the guys you don't hear too much talking about is the Boomer. And when I yeah. played with him in the in the Eastern League under Pop, I I swore that this guy was better than Brooks Robinson at third base. And I don't know how many people knew that the, he played third base before he came up to Boston. And I know at, at first base, he had to save us about a thousand errors on bad throws over there. But George was probably the best feeling third baseman I had seen in all the years, 14 years I played up and down in both American and National Leagues. He's better, I thought, better than Brooks Robinson because he covered a lot more ground. And talk about feeling the bunt when the guy came up that uh, – was uh, Pop thought he was going to bunt. He'd be telling George, George, move up. And George would take three steps backwards every time he told him to move up. Just <laughs> challenging these guys with those big hooks he had for hands there. I mean, he could come in and grab that thing bare hand and fire a bullet to first base. So I was just surprised Boomer. to find that they turned him into a first baseman when I knew they had slick fielding Tony Horton set up for first base. Boomer was a, I tell you what, he was a hell of a guy. He, we used to get a kick out of him. He'd, he'd go to the plate and somebody would throw him a pitch and he'd have a soft two hopper to the shortstop and he'd come back to the dugout and he'd say, damn, man, I killed that ball. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loved Boomer. You had to. Hey, you guys are talking about uh, the Hawks Nehru suit and that Blue one on the Sports Illustrated. I remember that. But I remember one night, Sparky and I went over to Hawk's apartment. Oh, the yeah. Had the round bed and so forth. <laughs> and Hawk gave me a present. So that had to be in 68, somewhere in there, 69. And to this day, I still have that present. <laughs> <laughs> I got your scarves to this day on. Save that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, Bill. I was going to make a, a virus mask out of them, but I don't, I don't know what it did. <laughs> Never let's go out of style. Let's, let's not go down that road. <laughs> I, you can't believe how much I am enjoying this. I tell you, I have loved these guys all my life, and I love them, and I'll take them to my grave. What a great bunch of guys to play with. And you know one thing about it? They busted their ass every day. That's that's a sign of a good manager. A good manager uh, is not wins and losses. A good manager is watch how hard the guys play for him. And every guy you're talking to tonight, every guy that was on that team, they busted their ass for Dick Williams. I'll tell you that. It, it, it was just a wonderful experience for me. Got to ask uh, Bill, uh, Bill Landis. Did you think that uh, the Red Sox would make the World Series a hundred to one shot? But if you thought about them making the World Series, did you think that you'd be in what Fort Polk, Louisiana, to watch the World Series? Unfortunately, <laughs> no. Uh, what happened? I'd been in the Re Army Reserves and hadn't gone to any active duty. And during the middle of the season, I got called in to active duty. And uh, Anyway, I went to an Army base. It wasn't the Boston Army base, but I can't remember. It was outside of Boston and saw the commanding officer and explained to him that I had a family 
in our contract, I wouldn't get paid. Uh, although Mr. Yaki says, don't worry about it, Bill. I'll take care of your family and you'll get your salary. And uh, they called the Pentagon and said, uh, they left up to that base commander, so he excused me. And then the next time I got called was the day before we won the pennant. So then I get down to Fort Polk and I found out my commanding officer was from Boston. He said, I'd let you off to go to the World Series. <laughs> it was kind, of, kind of late then, but uh, Kimber Brett took my place and God bless him. And uh, uh, Jim, talking about uh, Jim Lonborg, that uh, final day and the victory over Minnesota, uh, your uh, sleeping accommodations changed the night before, uh, courtesy of the Hawk. I guess the Hawk had a theory. You were a better pitcher on the road, so why not simulate it as a road game? Jim? We lose the sound with Jim Lonborg. Well, he moved indoors. Oh, Jim. Well, I think we, we might have just lost the audio with uh, with Jim. We'll see if we can get him back. Kevin, you have another question for uh, anybody on yeah, our panel? I, there was there was one in the really in the yeah, in the thick of the season. I'm I'm thinking this is July, late mid to late July. There's a ten game winning streak. And I think that it was on the road and I think it wrapped up with with uh, winning a doubleheader in Cleveland, I think, for games nine and ten of that trip. And but the scene at Logan, at least by the next day's papers, was ten thousand people at Logan to meet the team. I'm I'm just wondering what some of the guys might remember of of that day and then that crowd at, at Logan. That was something. That was absolutely something. And you know when we when we flew in. They brought the fire trucks up and they were playing, uh, spraying the water on the plane, which was a salute. And as I said, the, the guys on that 67 team, you know, I am so fortunate and have been on my whole life. I've got a World Series ring from 1967 and I've got a World Series ring with the White Sox from 05. And I think there's only one other guy that some writers have told me about that uh, that has both rings, and that's Carlton Fisk. And when we flew in after that that road trip, I'll never I'll never forget. It's one of the few times Yaz. He just turned it loose a little bit, you know. He he turned it loose because he was he was Yaz was an interesting guy. I mean, he was an interesting guy. He we're in Chicago one night, and Yaz is really struggling. And so he, after the game, he comes over to me and he never asked anybody anything about anything. You know, it's not that he thought he knew everything, but he didn't ask anybody anything. He comes over to me, he says, uh, have breakfast with me in the morning. So I said, okay. He said, what do you want? I said, give me some ham and eggs, whatever, milk, you know, and marsh juice. So I go up to the suite the next morning and he knew I had him down. I knew where his hands were supposed to be. I knew where his hands in, 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 in relationship to his helmet were supposed to be. I knew where his right shoulder was supposed to be. So I walk into a suite and there it is. They've got it all laid out to breakfast. You know, I got my ham and eggs and milk and, and things. You know what he's having for breakfast? Pizza and Beaujolais wine. <laughs> <laughs> that was yes. Breakfast of champions. That's right off the weed box. I'll tell you what, you made a believer out of me. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> Sign me up. Only, only yes. And, uh, and as you mentioned, uh, nobody quite like the accomplishments of him. The last, just to, we, no stats here, but uh, I'm compelled to say if, if anybody won did the last 12 games of the season, 523. Five home runs, 12 runs scored, 16 RBIs for the final 12 games, the final two weeks of the season. I mean, it's it unbelievable. Well, it was, you know, a, a couple of years ago, we're, we're playing the Tigers in Detroit and Al Kaline, who was one of my idols. I just love the – God bless his soul. So we're talking, Jimmy Price and Kaline and myself are talking, and Yaz's name comes up. And I said, Yaz is the greatest player I ever played with. 
and he's the greatest clutch hitter. And you know what Kaline said? He said, he's the greatest player I ever saw. Here's Al Kaline saying, Yaz was the greatest player he ever saw. It was unreal. Unreal. Kenny, you know what I really liked about uh, what Yaz did uh, that winter when I was uh, off skiing is that he hired Gene Birdie. <laughs> he had a different conditioning program, but he, he hired Gene Birdie, and here he is making 100 grand <clears throat> up at the Colonial Country Club. And he came into spring training in the best shape he'd ever been in in his life. And I think that, you know, he realized that if he wanted to become great, that he had to do something different during the off season. As you know what we used to do. We used to take our gloves and our shoes and our jocks and put them in a box and put them in a closet. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Know? And uh, we'd walk away for three months and never do a, a freaking thing. <laughs> that's, 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 uh, we'd open up the Jimmy, box, right? pull out the glove, pull out the jock, and go to spring training. <laughs> That is a great point. There's, nobody ever talks about Gene Birdie because, as he mentioned, Yaz came in, and then that's the year he won the Triple Crown. You know, and, and, and he used to have this tire that was cut, and he had it that, posted up on outside of the clubhouse there in Winter yeah, Haven. Right through the tire. Remember that? And he would stand there and swing his bat, go through that cut in the tire, which it, it took a couple of seconds to get through because that was the thing. And he got in the greatest shape is any player in that time zone that has ever been in. I told people about that. I'm just talking. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, Dan. Um, so after Tony got hit, uh, and then you go, Tony. and what was it like? Did, did, Tony come, did Tony come back and hang around the team after he had been hit? And was he around? in the final days of that season with you guys? What was that like? It was tragic. I mean, you know, I couldn't stand Tony when I played against him. And that's the biggest compliment you can pay somebody is when you really can't stand them because the reason you can't stand them is because they beat you, you know. And then when I came in and, and tried to fill his shoes, which nobody could. Ted Williams always said Tony Canigliaro was the greatest young home run hitter he had ever seen. And then I joined him in New York, and my first at bat, I hit a home run uh, over that scoreboard out there. And I think a lot of people to this day have said that that really helped because they thought when Tony went down, that everything was lost, you know. And, and, and Tony – when he came back, he and I became really tight. I mean, we, we became one of the saddest moments I have ever, ever experienced in my whole career was after a game. This is in 68. And, you know, I was having a good year. And, and we went out to this bar one night. And there was these three young ladies sitting there. And uh, they all said, Hawk, Hawk, can we have your autograph? Nobody even mentioned or looked at Tony. And when that happened, I, it broke my heart because this guy was truly, truly the one guy that I can say was totally fearless at the plate. I mean, he was totally fearless. If you threw it at his ribs, that's where you hit him. Now, occasionally he'd try to get out, but Jack Hamilton hit him with that spitter. You got away from it. You know, when you throw a spitter, is is not Lonnie. He didn't have, he didn't need a spitter, but at least pitchers will tell you a lot of times they're like a knuckleball. They get away from you. And Tony came back, and then he went to the Angels, and you know he had he couldn't see out of his left eye. He couldn't see. In other words, if he was looking at a TV, he could see the the outer perimeter of it, but he couldn't see the middle of it. He still hit thirty six home runs. That's him with the angels. I love that kid to death. And I'll tell you what, I love Billy too, because Billy, Billy sat there and, and he nursed his brother. Everybody had the blind spot. Yeah. Just he really nursed his brother and awesome. until Tony passed and I'll the ball and fix it back up. Yeah. You know, with, with Sal, Sal and, and, and Maria, that was a great family. I tell you. 
Jim, we got your audio back, and I had asked the question about the final game of the 67 season and uh, the fact that uh, you got an assist from the Hawk to uh, change your sleeping arrangements to kind of simulate it as a road game for the night before. Can you address that for us, please? It worked anyway. <laughs> that, that was such a, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> He knew I lived in a bachelor pad over in Charles River Park uh, with a couple of guys, well, with Dennis Bennett, um, who was, uh, you know, a real regular guy, but, you know, both on and off the field. Um, and Neil McNary, who owned a couple of bars in, in Kenmore Square, uh, he knew that I wasn't going to be able to get back home and have any semblance of a good night's sleep. So he said, I'm staying at the Sheraton, take my room, and um, you know, get a good night's sleep. And I, I took him up on his, uh, on his offer. And, and the funny thing that happened that night was I was reading a book by the uh, guy by the name of Bill Craig. And he had written a book called The Fall of Japan. And um, I fell asleep reading the book. <laughs> a couple of days later, somebody asked me, he said, you know, what did you do the night before that game? And I said, I read a book by my friend, Bill Craig, but I fell asleep and got a really good night's sleep. And Bill Craig has never forgiven me. <laughs> <laughs> All in his sleep, reading, reading his book. But Ken was so generous to offer because he knew that I had a better road record that summer than I had a home record. And, um, you know, the least he could have done was change the sheets or something. <laughs> <laughs> now, hey, that's cold. That's really cold. I know. <laughs> hey, guys, listen, I have enjoyed this immensely. I've got to go now. I love you all. I miss you all. And I can tell you one thing right now. You will never leave my heart. Goodbye, guys. Hey, Hawk. Congratulations hey, on Hawk, your gravy. Congratulations, Hawk. 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 Yeah. Before you leave, congratulations on the HOF. Can't wait to hear your speech. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing. It's, it's, they made the right decision in, in canceling it because, you know, they called me and asked me what I thought. And I told them, I said, I'm not going to bring my family because Jeter's going in and there's going to be 100,000 people there. You know, they're going to fly <laughs> Yankee fans. They're going to fly from all over the world and justifiably so. But they made the right decision, and 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 I, I I just feel honored. There's no question about that. You know, with all, we'll you know we'll get together again in a, a reunion of some sort, and we'll do what we always used to do: sit around and tell some lies. <laughs> we love you, Hawk. <laughs> I love you guys, and I always will. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. Right. See ya. The Hawk, ladies and gentlemen, bidding bidding adieu from the Hawk. The Hawk bids Hubba do, and uh, we move on with uh, the rest of the you know, the rest of the guys. Is hopefully still with us here. Uh, Dan, another question uh, for any of the uh, the fellas here. Well, I always have questions for Jim Lonborg, and um, I wanted to know the exact circumstances of your skiing accident after the '67 season. Like, what was that all about? All right, Dan, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll, um, so this is not like going out for publication, right? No, no, no. <laughs> Just us talking here. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not going to have to read about the fact no. that I, so, um, I was a really a, a lot better skier than you give me credit for. No, you were good. I've seen it. The whole <laughs> Longboard family's good. I know that. So anyway, uh, my friend, uh, uh, Hans Kramer and I, the Heavenly Valley had just opened up the, the Nevada side of the mountain. And um, we had uh, gone out to Harris uh, Club there on uh, State Line in um, Nevada. And we were there way too long. So no sleep. But what are you? You're 25 years old. You're as strong as you could ever want to be. Uh, you get up the next morning and you go skiing. So we'd heard that the Nevada side had opened up. So we went over to the Nevada side and it was late in the afternoon. Uh, we missed the lift to bring us back over to the other side. So we climbed up over the top of the mountain, 
back to the California side, come upon a race course. And I said, what harm can there be to go out and do a little race down the race course? So I get down through about four or five gates and all of a sudden I catch an edge. And in those days when they put you in the ski boots and on the skis, you never left the skis. You were always in there. So all I felt was a pop, pop, pop. It didn't even hurt. I get up and said, wow, that was interesting. And I start back down the mountain. I went to go to make that same turn and there was nothing there. And I fell again. <laughs> So I skied down uh, the right side all the way down to the rest of the mountain. And we get to the bar. We have some hot bodies. So we're sitting at the bar. And then all of a sudden, uh, it's time to go. And I get up and I can't walk. We go down to the, <laughs> the, the medic. This is, I'm not going to make this story long. We go down to the medic and he says, what do you do for a living? And I says, well, I, I, I pitch for the Red Sox. <laughs> it's my How they bend it sometimes when there's no ligaments and, and it, it, it like bent a lot farther than was supposed to. He says, well, I suggest you get it back home right away. It was an unfortunate, uh, youthful uh, error on my part because, hey, we just won the American League Championship. <laughs> it's time to play. Yeah, there you go. Unfortunate. Oh, well, uh, I have another one. To that point, in after your bunt in the sixth inning of the last game, were you not at your pitch count by that point? What was your pitch count that day? Weren't you supposed to come out of the game? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I don't think we even had pitch counts in those days. Uh, <laughs> You know, and I, I, I think all of the pitchers can say that as long as your stuff was good. I think as long as your stuff was good, they kept you in the game. How many did you throw that day? Uh, what was it, nine innings? Yeah. Five hits, probably 120 pitches. Yeah. <laughs> you would have never pitched the ninth inning now. Never. No. That's true. Maybe not the eighth. No. I, maybe not the sixth. Yeah, that's exactly. Well, to, to, to that point, uh, to, uh, to Gary Wozlewski, uh, talking about pitch counts, just noted the fact that, uh, you had a game in 67 in Chicago, you went nine shutout innings and then had a muscle pull in the 10th and thus came out of the game. So the fact that you were still in there in the 10th, you were pitching well, and you were still in there and, uh, pitching counts had not been invented yet. Well, the muscle pull came about the seventh or eighth inning, not the tenth. And I tried to hang there as long as I could. And, and uh, somebody got on base, and I knew they were going to bunt. And that's when I called timeout, and I said, if I have to bend over to get, feel the bunt, I'm not going to get back up again. And in the tenth. That, that's when yeah. he took me out. And then luckily, um, Tony came – well, Wyatt came in, saved us, and then Tony uh, took him deep in the eleventh inning, I guess it was. What was the game in Chicago when Brandon walked four guys in the extra innings? You lost the game one nothing. <laughs> mm, I don't know. It was the same day as Tartable's throw. It was the second game of the doubleheader. The second game of the doubleheader that day. That's yeah. right. Tartable makes the throw and you win the first one. And then Brandon walked four guys in extra innings and lost one nothing. <laughs> lost, lost to Gary Peters. You know, Dan, I talked to Ken Berry the other day and uh, he told me. Uh, and, and vivid memories about that throw that Danny, uh, that, yeah. that uh, Jose Tartabill uh, threw from right field. And he said the day before they were at a golf tournament, he stepped into a hole and sprained his ankle. Really? And wow. uh, he came to the game and you never said anything to Eddie Stanky about not being able to play. Right. And so he, it comes in and they put him in as a pinch hitter. And so uh, Jose is out in, he's probably like 150 feet in right field. Yeah. And Dwayne Josephson is a hitter. <laughs> and he's that little blooper out there. And uh, Kenny said, I said, I said, please drop it. I, I said, I want to be able to score easily. I said, I don't want to have to run on my sprained ankle. Yeah. <laughs> but he didn't drop it, obviously. And he threw that 
magnificent. Well, I, it was kind of an alley oop, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Elston Howard yeah, made the and, sweep tag, caught it high, sweep tag. Marty Springstead was home plate umpire. Yeah, and he told me on the phone, Dan, that he was out. <laughs> no argument. No argument. Fifty-three no years later. Hey, I love all you guys. It's Sparky. I gotta go. And uh, thank you for. Uh, I love all you guys. That was one of the greatest uh, times of my life. And I hope to see all you guys up in Boston one of these days. Thank Thanks, very. Thank you, Sparky. Thanks, Sparky. Thanks, Sparky. Thanks, Sparky. Thanks, Sparky. Thanks, Sparky. Hey, Bill. Love you, man. Good seeing you. See you, buddy. Nice to see you. Bye. Kevin, back to you. Yeah, I'm just wondering. You know, I was thinking of uh, some of the beat guys at the time, and I'm, I'm just curious from the guys about what that relationship was. So we've got guys like Cliff Keen and Jake Liston and, and Claflin. What, what was the kind of relationship there? Was it friendly? Was it adversarial? I always got along uh, with the two guys, um, even though Clap, uh, Claflin got me in trouble in Puerto Rico when uh, he relayed my uh, comment to, to Dick. Um, but I always thought they were pretty fair, uh, funny about what they were doing. So, you know, it was kind of they were kind of like well, like with Dick, you know, hey, you can't make a throw to somebody. You got to write it up and call you a bad thrower, you know, or you can't pitch strikes or you can't hit the ball. I thought they kind of told it like it was and uh, on a good-natured basis, too. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think one of the benefits we had in those days was that we lived with these guys. Uh, we stayed in the same hotels with travel, them. We yep. flew on the same planes with them. Uh, we had drinks after the ball game with them. Uh, and I learned so much from Cliff Keen and Larry Claflin. Uh, uh, we had spring training. They would invite all the ball players over to their hotel. It was a family affair. Uh, you know, they were part of no, our I life. It off, but other than and uh, it was it was a a time you know gone past. Um, but I felt like they were our friends. They were very very smart people, and I learned a lot from them, sitting at some bars every now and then. <laughs> Want a lot in bars, Jim? No question. Uh, <laughs> I I got a, a question. Dave Moore had talked about there was only I guess twelve hundred people at uh, your no hitter in nineteen sixty five. What about the whole concept of coming to the ballpark and seeing people there, and suddenly the ballpark filling up, and you get back from the uh, the ten game uh, from the road trip, the ten game winning streak, the six on the road, and now all of a sudden. Uh, Fenway was the place to be. What about that phenomenon for you as a player and how that affected you? Well, that's, uh, that was what was so amazing. Um, when I came back, I actually, I came back right after the 10 game, uh, winning streak back from Toronto. And, uh, you're right. Uh, the last time that, uh, I was in uh, Fenway was, uh, you know, we might have drawn five or six thousand for a home game, and then to come back and see a, a full stadium, um, the excitement and uh, uh, it was unreal. It, it was just uh, it was incredible, and uh, and I think Dan uh, said it earlier. Uh, ever since, it's it's kind of carried over and been that way, and that uh, uh, is really special. Is uh is Dalton still there? Dalton, yeah, I'm here. Hey, uh -huh. Dalton, you know, as as young fans, we were so impressed with with you as a hitter, and you played all those positions. But you know, you were sort of a specialist. And was there ever a point? I mean, was it hard for you to not be an everyday player when you were such a good hitter? Well, uh, the fact is, I always wanted to to be a regular and and play every day and. Really, it turned out to be uh, a bad thing for me because really, if I had just gotten used to the idea of what I was doing, I mean, I, I was helping the ball club out, uh, playing different positions and uh, pinch hitting, you know, I, I did that pretty fair. And, 
and I, and I was getting to play a lot. Yeah. But I, I really think looking back that me, you sort of pushing, real pushing Dick to, to let me start yeah. is really the, the beginning of my, you know, my decline because, uh, you know, I wanted it so bad then that, then it, you know, that, that hitting that I was doing in 67, I wish I could have uh, bottled it up and brought it back out when I was starting. <laughs> but but uh, it just didn't work. I, I tried too hard. I tried to hit home runs, and I'm not a home run hitter. Right. Well, we're not very smart about baseball, but as a young fan, we could see what you had. And I always, whenever you came up there, I always felt good, like this guy's going to get a hit because you could spray the ball. You know, all fields, you could handle inside, outside. And it was just, we had a lot of confidence watching you at the plate at all times. Well, I always felt like that if I was up there, that I wasn't the one in trouble as a guy on the mound. Yep. So that's kind of the way I tried to feel about it. It was good. Yeah, hmm. what, we, what we remember about hitters are, are the hits, of course, Dalton. But with you, not just the hits, but the swing, the fluidity of your swing. Did you always have that, or were, were there guys you watched along the way that you, you got that from? I just grew up with it. Um, yeah, I, I never did try to copy anybody. It's just uh, used to throw rocks up and hit them with a broomstick. Maybe that's where I learned. I don't know. But, uh, you know, it just came natural until I started – doubting myself and then asking people what was wrong and of course you ask that you're going to get a lot a lot of advice and most of it's going to hurt you well so this right. is a question about the the californians that you had on the team i got dave moorhead and jim lonborg here but was jerry stevenson on this team at any point yes he was yeah. all right so yes who had the strongest arm on that team the strongest arm. Who could throw the ball the furthest? What? Who could throw the ball the furthest if you had to chuck it? Reggie Smith. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jerry, I'd probably yeah. throw a marshmallow through a freight train. Jerry Stevenson had an electric arm. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it was. Um, I pitied some of the guys that had to face him. Uh, when he was throwing well, but you know, his arm was so electric. I think that it created so much trauma, uh, which I, when I look at the way that some of the pitchers throw today, their, their motions are so traumatic, Violent. Um, yeah. um, right. but he had electric stuff. And his, his dad was a scout, right? Yes, he was Joe. Correct. Yeah. Joe. Did uh, yeah, St Stevie, Stevie, as Lonnie was saying, Stevie's, his ball was all over. I mean, he he was hard to catch when the catcher knew a, a fastball was coming because it would sail and sink, and uh, he was amazing. He was also a very interesting guy, too. I have a nightmare. lot of fun. He used to have nightmares because I roomed with him quite a few times on the road. He scared the hell out of you at night. He'd wake up screaming. He had to hit the floor. I think somebody was in the room trying to kill us. And he was having some kind of nightmare. <laughs> Dick Dick Williams came up with uh, with a penalty for us when we were pitching in Toronto in the International League in '65 or '6. And Stevie Jerry Stevenson was on the on the club. Dick announced one day that the next guy that gave up an 0 and 2 base hit was going to get fined, you know, a jillion dollars or maybe just taken out and shot. <laughs> Stevie went out and Stevie was pitching. Jerry went out to pitch the, the next inning and got an 0 and 2 count on the first or second hitter that he faced. The next pitch he threw went into the press box, which was about 90. <laughs> above and behind home plate and <laughs> cracked a smile, never did a thing, just threw it into the press box and now the count <laughs> one and two and the deal was off with Dick. <laughs> Billy, were and, you there then, at the and, when uh, Dick uh, and he went, got into it? Were any of you guys on the team when uh, yeah. Dick Williams and Mickey when, Sinks got into it in the uh, clubhouse? 
just yeah. before we came to the ballpark there. Yeah. The two of them fell uh, with a bear hug into the closet. They were wedged in the doorway on the floor. Russ Gibson had to break it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mention, mention about Russ Gibson, Billy. A lot of people maybe don't know that was Russ Gibson's debut. It was uh, spent a uh, rather lengthy amount of time, long time in the minors. Uh, he also made his debut behind the plate with your debut on the mound that day. He did. And God rest his soul. I, I love Gibby and his quote uh, in, in subsequent years when we would go to functions back in New England somewhere and somebody would say something to Russ about the game that I pitched, he would basically respond with, to hell with Roar, I went two for four off of Whitey Ford. <laughs> and pretty hard to argue with that. That's right. Whitey Ford is 432nd major league start that day, and he went two for right. four. So can't take that away from him. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, uh, Billy, who was your roomie that night? The night before that? Oh, my buddy Jim Lonborg, and we Hello. set up and set up and talked till about six in the morning. In the morning, please. <laughs> then got up at nine and went and had breakfast. Uh, you weren't formula. nervous, were you? You weren't too nervous, were you? I don't know. You can just take so much Valium when you're 21, and pretty soon the <laughs> bottle's empty. You got to do something. So you talk to your roomie until six a.m. Uh, it worked for you. It uh, also uh, was alluded to earlier about the uh, the crowd at the airport. Uh, 10,000, 15,000. You guys remember that. Was that uh, a, a Beatlesque moment for you guys? Did you suddenly think that you were uh, the four lovable mop tops from England or something that were being uh, mobbed on the tarmac? I mean, that, that must have just been surreal. I mean, you weren't even in first place. You won 10 in a row, but it was really maybe the moment that uh, Red Sox Nation was born. You know, I, I don't think any of us had any idea that was going uh, that was going to happen. I mean, given what you go through today with security at an airport, uh, to think that a, a plane would fly at a lo land at Logan Airport and you had to divert it uh, from the uh, from the runway because there were people actually on the tarmac, um, <laughs> you know, that is like, you could not explain that to any young person today. Um, <laughs> but for us to enjoy that and see the response of all the wonderful fans in New England, to realize that they really loved us and they wanted to see us do well, um, it was just heartwarming. Kevin or Dan, either one. Uh, I have one for Billy um, okay. uh, regarding the acquisition of Elston Howard. Did you guys talk about that later on? I mean, him getting the hit off you? <laughs> I don't know that Ellie and I ever discussed it when Ellie and I were just talking, but we were interviewed jointly about it by every by every writer that walked through the door. Uh, Elston and I, I mean, it was a hanging curveball, and he did exactly what you're supposed to do to hanging curveballs, and we didn't, I don't think there was much else to say about it. <laughs> well, sometimes they pop them up. <laughs> well, maybe we can go back and do it again. I'm not sure I could get it up there this trip. <laughs> And they, and they took, Dang, a, they took Dang, a pitch away from it, Billy, too. Two and two pitch that would have been strike three, right? To this day? I think it was, and I think Cal drunk. Well, Ellie thought it was strike three. Gibby thought it was. I was pretty sure it was, and that was 53 years ago. By now, I know damn good and well it was. Split the middle of the plate 53 years later. Yeah. yeah. Kevin? Kevin? Yep. Yeah, just you know, the, the the signature moment in my mind here is that season ended was the was the Rich Rollins pop up to end to end that game, and I'm I'm just curious from each of their perspectives what what they were thinking as that last out's made and and everyone's running on the field. Um, I'll start. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> 
All right, so I'll tell you, uh, it was a sidearm fastball that I got in on his hands, and um, he popped it up to Rico. And I have a, uh, I have a lot of pictures, but one of my favorite pictures is Yaz with his with his arms straight up in the air, and Rico with a ball in his glove straight up in the, in the air, and I'm uh, jumping off the mound with my arms straight up in the air. And it was a moment where everything was the way it was supposed to be. And then within five minutes, uh, five minutes, what is it? What do they call it? Pandemonium on the field. Ned uh, Martin, that's right. Yeah, it was uh, it was great to be with your uh, with your teammates celebrating, and then all of a sudden you looked around, and not everybody that was there was your teammate. <laughs> <laughs> And you really wanted to be back in the, everybody wanted, I wanted to be back in the clubhouse. <laughs> Good luck getting there. I, I remember, what I remember is running in from the bullpen and we were about halfway in and Lonnie's in right field up against the, the bullpen in right field where all the people, that was amazing. Hmm? Yeah. Very exciting. Hmm? I want to be in the, I want to be in the clubhouse with you guys. <laughs> Gang, this is Dalton. I'm gonna have to say goodbye. Okay, I, I sure I've enjoyed being with you, and and we did something special together, and and I'll never forget it. Thank you, uh, Dalton. So good to hear your voice, DJ. Thanks, Thanks very much for joining us, Dalton. Appreciate it. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Too. It's getting kind of late, and uh, I have to get up by ten tomorrow. So uh, all right, very healthy guys. <laughs> Hope to okay. see you maybe at okay. the. Uh, I was going to say the August game in Fenway, but uh, I don't know about this year, but stay healthy. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate that. Uh, I got some shows to watch, man. Yeah, that's right. Jim's yeah. got to do, do a little binge watching. Yeah. What, are you, what are you binge watching, Jim? <laughs> We're doing Netflix. What are you doing? Ah, uh, we just, uh, we did all the James Bond movies and now we're watching, uh, White Lines. Okay. Okay. The program. We're, we're doing Game of Thrones. All right, Dave. Bill, what about you? West Wing. Okay. All right. Billy? Well, I've been playing golf a lot. Yep. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> at my age, I see a lot of doctors. <laughs> The, so what are you, like a five or a six, Billy? No, uh, it's been pretty bad, Jim. I've got some medical problems, so but we're getting there, so we'll be all right. Well, you, you didn't answer my question. I, know, <laughs> I don't cop out. <laughs> Just re remember that. I am playing five or six times a week. Yeah. <laughs> Only five. <laughs> you still haven't answered my question. What's your no, handicap? No reason, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Back again. <laughs> Good to see you, buddy. Same here. You guys all take care of yourself. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thanks very much. Good yeah, to Billy. See you, Billy. Bill Landis, Dave Moorhead, Jim Lonborg, and uh, Kevin and Dan. We a postscript to this, if you guys will stay with me here. Sure. And uh, once again, I want to thank uh, our friend Nick Riccio at Nautical Beach Properties in Hampton, New Hampshire, and hope everybody will be able to get back there. And Nick will be the guy to take care of you. As, uh, Hope we uh, get to uh, return to more normalcy this summer. You can go to nauticalbeachproperties.com. And uh, Nick, great uh, baseball fan, baseball man, and baseball collector. Also, uh, thanks to Phil Castanetti here at Sports World and uh, the legendary and world-famous Phil Castanetti. And uh, wouldn't you know it, the picture here, I don't know if it's any relation, but different spelling, uh, that came from Castagnetti Brothers, so, so uh, not – Castanetti, but Castagnetti. And uh, thanks uh, also to uh, Mike Weber. Uh, we had some, some technical issues at the beginning. And uh, this is uh, really uh, for uh, Kevin and Dan. And uh, my, my first reading was going to be from the book of Fitzgerald. So we can, we can all bless ourselves now. But uh, I know that Ray was uh, a guy that you uh, certainly, both of you guys looked up to. But uh, as a postscript uh, to, uh, to the evening uh, from uh, Ray's Champions Remembered, there had never been anything like it in Boston. Oh, certainly there'd been great baseball teams, world champions, but never a season to match 1967. 
the exploits of the Boston Red Sox took over the city that long, hot summer. Nobody went to the beach for the weekend without a transistor radio to keep posted on the Sox. Stop for a traffic light and you could hear coming from other automobiles, the voices of Ken Coleman and Ned Martin. Adair is up with it. Over to Scott and the ball game is over. The Red Sox have won again. 10,000 fans greeted the team at Logan Airport when it returned from 10 straight victories in the Midwest. The Man of La Mancha was the Broadway smash that season and its hit song was The Impossible Dream. Somebody with a sense of history tagged the 67 Red Sox with that name. It became the year of the impossible dream when a team of underdogs would reach for and capture the unreachable star along with the hearts of millions of baseball fans. So that one was for everybody, but particularly for uh, Dan and Kevin, because I know how much uh, Ray Fitzgerald meant to you, uh, the great uh, scribe, but one of uh, your uh, luminaries, predecessors at the Boston Globe. And I uh, want to uh, thank everybody uh, for joining us uh, to remember this summer. And we've got a summer without baseball right now. So my final question is for Dan Shaughnessy. Dan, uh, the Red Sox were 100-1 to 1 in 1967 to win the pennant. What are the odds that we're going to get a baseball season? Well, it's <laughs> never as bad as it looks at the time. So right now it feels like 100-1 to 1 that they're even going to play a game. So, <laughs> But I always say reserve uh, snap and judgment on that. We'll see how it plays out. Hopefully cooler heads will prevail. It's a bad situation. And I hope they get their act together because there's no appetite for what's happening right now. And, and folks are not going to forgive them if they don't get some games played. Amen. Kevin, Kevin, did you feel 14 again on this show? Kevin, do yeah. Well, it was yeah. wonderful. I mean, it was hard not to drift back to, you know, just the stuff we've talked about here. Ned Martin's calls and, and uh, a real treat for me, Bernie, to, 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 uh, to talk to some of these guys and, and, uh, and relive those moments. So thank you. Thanks. And uh, final words to Bill, Bill Landis. You got a tea time or it's a little late right now. Bill? Not the West Coast is not. That, well, that's right. You're in Cal. That's right. Early enough for you. Right. I know. <laughs> and final word for you, Bill, to uh, as we uh, depart here, as we say goodbye. Well, it's good seeing all the uh, old friends. You know, it's uh, we don't get to see each other that often, but it's, uh, it's always wonderful to see them and hope everybody's doing well. Okay. Thank, thanks Bill, to you. Bill, how come you have a Cardinals uh, uniform in your room? You didn't notice that. Well, that was my last year in baseball. I played for the Cardinals. Okay. <laughs> Should have taken that down for the purposes if of the If you show. look at the other one, it was the Kansas City A's when their colors <laughs> were uh, red, white, and blue. <laughs> uh, Bill, Bill Rohr, final word from California. You're also on the West Coast. You could get a tea time yourself right now, counselor. I could. I could walk out the back door to the second tea because I live on it. Uh, Bernie, I want to thank you for the uh, – for the opportunity to get together. And I want to say hi to Jim and Bill and Dave and all the guys that were there. And I look forward to seeing you all again. Great to see you. Billy. Thanks, Bill. Dave, Dave Moorhead, final word from you, sir. It's been a pleasure, Bernie and guys, uh, as always, it's good to get, get together. One thing we've been very lucky, um, uh, over the years and, uh, uh, from 67, I, I tell a lot of my friends that they just find it hard to believe, but uh, Yaz had a lot to do with it with his agent, uh, uh, Dick Gordon. And we were so fortunate with Dick and, and the Red Sox involved to be able to get together almost every five years, which is really unheard of if you really think about it. And uh, uh, in fact, my son the other day just... Uh, sent me a, a, a video of uh, the 100 year celebration at Fenway, which was very special and uh, kind of spent eight years now in two, uh, 2012. So uh, it's always great. We have a lot of great memories and it's really been a fun, fun afternoon. Thanks much. See you guys. Thanks, Dave. Good to see you, David. See you, David. And, and uh, Jim, I, I have to say that uh, you were spared, I think, uh, well, maybe some degree of attack with Gary Bell uh, having to uh, send his regrets because uh, I'm glad you told the ski story because Gary has a different version, which involves you chasing Jill St. John. You know, <laughs> what, do they, what do they call it? Fake news? <laughs> I think so. I'm glad you clarified that and told I the think, truth. I think, 
I did had a I had a photo op with her. I mean, that was pretty cool. But yep. then I went up. I was more interested in skiing in those days than her. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm glad we I'm glad <laughs> okay. we glad we clarified that, Jim. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, what a treasure tonight was. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, once again, thanks to everybody uh, that made it possible. Mike Weber at Foxborough Cable Access uh, for assisting us technically. Uh, Games People Play production with uh, my producer and uh, partner in crime here, Andy Bernstein. And uh, once again, final time, uh, thanks uh, to our sponsor that made it possible, Nautical Beach Properties and uh, Nick Riccio. And up at uh, Hampton Beach, and we can only hope that uh, we'll be able to get back there and get a little normalcy in the summer. And as Dan Shaughnessy pointed out, maybe a summer without baseball. Perish the thought to all of us. Glad we could take a trip back uh, to uh, the summer of uh, 1967 where there was uh, uh, unrest and uh, racial tension. Uh, well, is it 2020 or is it 1967, right? But uh, we can only hope that we're going to get some baseball to uh, be a very welcomed uh, distraction for us and, and pastime. Uh, here during this summer. Uh, to uh, my panelists, uh, Kevin DuPont and Dan Shaughnessy, and the rest of the Eyewitness News team, make it a good night. Uh, really appreciate uh, you guys joining me. And of course, uh, to the legend himself, Phil Castanetti, here at his uh, emporium of sports, Sports World, it truly is, on Route 1 in Saugus. So for all you impossible dreamers, uh, oh my make 2020 the summer of love. This is Bernie Corbett saying, oh. Good night from Route 1. All right, then. This is really a love story. An affair twixt a town and a team. A town that had waited and waited for what seemed an impossible dream. Here's the pitch, and Scott hits one deep into center field.